Good afternoon, folks. <laughs> um, welcome to the panel on um, global warming and the impacts on investment opportunities. In December 2015, a significant agreement uh, was reached in uh, amongst 195 <laughs> nations um, in Paris um, at what was called the Conference of Parties, or more commonly known as COP21. Um, and with countries now agreeing to limit um, global temperature rises to well below two degrees, and in fact aiming for 1.5 degrees. Before we start um, our panel and introduce the panel members, we're going to hear an address by the General Secretary of the United Nations, Mr. Ban Ki-moon. I'm pleased to send greetings to the 19th Asian Investment Conference. Last year, the world's leaders unanimously committed to eradicate extreme poverty, address climate change, and build more resilient societies. We have a blueprint for sustainable development. Now, the real work and the real opportunities begin. To turn these promises into reality, we need you. As investors and financiers, you have an essential role in guaranteeing the well-being of people and the planet for generations to come. You hold the future in your hands. This is no exaggeration. Our climate is warming at an unprecedented rate. The decisions you make over the next few years will determine whether we can limit temperature rise to well below 2 degrees Celsius. This threshold is critical. The stability of economies and decades of hard-won development gains are at risk. We must end our dependence on fu fossil fuels and embrace the promise of renewable energy. Trillions of dollars of new opportunities await for those who invest in low-carbon infrastructure and new green technologies. The world counts on your support for sustainable development. I urge you to make all your investments that climate smart investments we need to build the future we want. I wish you a successful and productive conference. Thank you. Let me introduce the panel to you. So Christine Lowe is well known here in Hong Kong as a member of the Hong Kong Special Administrative Region Government and as a former CEO and founder of the think, th think tank Civic Exchange. And as a politician and a promoter of environmental um, protection and current undersecretary of the environment. Welcome, Christine. Uh, Mark. Mark Fulton is an energy uh, economist with a passion for the environment and sustainability. He was a former head of um, research at Deutsche, Deutsche Bank's climate um, change uh, advisors with thought papers on climate, clean technology and sustainability and advised investors on asset management. Amongst other things, at the, in the past he's been on the technology committee of the United uh, Nations Secretary General's Sustainable Energy for Oil. And Tessa Tannant, welcome Tessa. Tessa's a serial innovator in sustainable finance. Um, co-founder of the UK's first green investment bank back in 1988. Not a bank. A bank. <laughs> and very successful, um, the very successful climate disclosure project. She is currently focused on the financing needs that flow out of the Paris Agreement. Um, in 2012, she's the first non-US person awarded the Joan Bavaria Award for her contribution to sustainable finance. Welcome, Tessa. So we've just heard from um, Mr. Ban Ki-moon um, urging us all to action on um, investors, as investors and financiers. Climate change and global warming are probably just one of the many disruptive influences that business face. So Christine, out of what happened at Paris with 195 governments agreeing, um, what's, what's the role of um, those nations and what's the role of China in those negotiations? Well, maybe what I can uh, just share with you is the perspective of what really happened at, at COP21. And I think why it's really important for governments to take note and also for business to take note. First of all is we have 195 countries, as you all know, they all signed on. 
and they were able to sign on to something and come to an agreement because it wasn't forced on them. They were asked to put forward what they were willing to do. However, they also agreed that looking at the science, their collective willing to do list was not enough to meet the two degrees target. So they then agreed as part of the Paris Agreement, and this is a really, really important point, that every five years they would have a review. And the purpose of this review is so that countries can ratchet up. So this is what they're prepared to do now, but every five years they're going to have to do more. So for a government like mine in Hong Kong, what we're doing is to now mirror our policy making timetable according to the Paris Agreement every five years. Hong Kong is part of China under the COP arrangements. And the thing to note about China is, China is now a very important country in climate change. You could say 10 years ago, China was still debating about what role it should have. It was still talking about needing carbon space to continue to develop. But today, the picture is so different. China accepts that it has responsibility to itself. And it is now a leader in climate policy and climate diplomacy. So Hong Kong, as a part of China, recognizes that the nation is moving on. It set an ambitious target for 2030. And actually, it has hundreds of experts working within government research institutions looking at what China should do assessing scenarios for 2040, 2050. So China is a major player, and Hong Kong, too, has to step up. Thank you, Christine. Mark, looking forward, often when we try and talk about issues in climate, we get uh, focused on the here and now. Looking forward 20 years, what do you think are going to be some of the major changes that are going to flow out of the Paris Agreement? If you had to look right out, and your, your space is, is power and energy. Yeah, well, um, I, I probably talk more as an economist and market strategist sell-side type of a guy than I do, you know, as a climate. I believe in climate. I think policy is very important. But I'd like to bring it back to some economic trends. And the trend, I think, that's really so dominant at this conference is uncertainty and technology disruption. And this is what essentially is going to drive energy markets, is already here. The energy transition is underway. Um, and uh, the question is how rapid and how disruptive. And unfortunately for all of us, how do you make money out of it? It's not quite going to be quite so easy, I'm guessing. But we're going to give it a good go. So I would say 20 years from now, it's fairly obvious we're going to have a more diversified and a more distributed energy system. We're going to see the transport markets looking much more like the presentation we had on driverless cars and EVs. I mean, how again, how rapid that is, we don't know yet, but it could be very, very rapid. So I don't think anyone, when we talk to the major oil and gas and coal companies, does anyone really disbelieve in 20 years from now there won't be a lot of diversification, a lot of change? No, they all agree with that. The argument is over the pace. That's the key. How long have you got? And as an investor, I always remind people that you can get an economic trend right, making money out of it is tricky. And speed of adjustment is tricky. And the big oil companies all think that they will be able to have the time to spot the changes and change who they want to be, for instance. I keep reminding them that the stock market's a bit quicker than that. Once they sense something's going to happen, their cost of capital's going up because their share prices are coming down and their debt servicing is going up. So I think, you know, for the industry and for investors, what I think we're in is, you know, these inflection points in stock markets and investable assets may come very quickly indeed. And then I go on to what I'm really, uh, we, I, you know, I work the Carbon Tracker Initiative, so we're stranded assets. One thing I will say to you is, I think the word for that in China is zombie companies. I've discovered stranded assets are probably buried in zombie companies. So one of the things I think we're going to see is 20 years from now, I'm afraid there's going to be a lot of stranded assets out there. 
big winners and losers because as we, when you build a 40-year asset, when you don't know really what's going to happen, that's a bit risky. And that's called the power industry. And that's utilities. That's power generation. So I think power generation is really like on, on, on the, uh, going to have to work very, very hard on this. So I actually had one chart I wanted to show, which I think shows you why the energy transition is underway. That's the IEA's relationship of uh, CO2 to uh, energy. And essentially, we have seen two years of decoupling, where emissions are flat or down while the world economy and energy markets are rising. That should strike fear into everyone who's trying to invest. That means something big is happening. That is a change in energy intensity mix away from uh, coal in the United States and China, an increase in renewables, and a massive increase in efficiency. One of the areas I think that we all want to look to is efficiency. Maybe that's the one thing that we can bet on, know what we're doing, and is a win-win. And I think property is important in that. So policy, we've heard a lot about policy. I think it's regional, it's specific, it's going to change over time. Incentives will decline over time in renewable energy, but you know what? They're going to decline in fossil fuels if we have our way. I mean, the amount of evidence we have on uh, subsidies in fossil fuels remains very, very high. So as the level playing fields get, uh, the playing fields get leveled, watch out. It's not just incentives on renewables that are going to go down. My belief incentives in fossil fuels are going to go down too. So at the end of the day, there's one big thing that will trigger the whole revolution. And by the way, the day that a battery company announces a massive proven breakthrough which brings down the cost of battery storage by multiples. And by the way, there are a few out there. You can't get into them right now. Silicon Valley is tight. I've had a go. You know, the boys are in big. The day they announce that, you watch stock markets move. You watch the repricing of all the energy sector. And is it Tesla? The Saudis seem to get it. Two trillion dollar fund because they think one day they're out of oil. So it's happening. People are thinking about it. It, fil it fits the disruption. As investors, what can you do? Well, unfortunately, you've got to get the right companies, haven't you? you know, you've got to pick the winners and miss the losers. I'm currently with a new renewable energy um, infrastructure startup fund. So I've gone back into that after after a while, and so I'm hoping that we can pick good projects in the US, Australia, and the UK. That's going to be our, our sort of initial areas in the OECD. But it's, it, you know, you've got to focus, you've got to know your market niche, development capital, 12 to 15 percent, mature uh, capital, 6 to 7 percent, yield codes, been a bit of a problem, didn't work out too well, over aggressive leverage problems. So, you know, there's no easy silver bullet here. But I think the trend is unstoppable. The, uh, you know, green bonds and securitization. I swear I'll never use the three letters C, D, and O together. But, you know, there will be securitization taking place in the green bond market. And that is the great engine of capital uh, formation, if it works. So I think that um, there's fantastic opportunities. But, you know, having been there at Deutsche Bank and had a go at this, it's tricky. <laughs> so, you know, we all know that picking the winners and losers is not easy. You know, but the energy sector is, and the transport sector are now in play, in transition. And, um, you know, it, it, it's a very big trend. Tessa, you're involved in the financing of sustainable um, projects. What's the Paris Agreement mean for divestment and investment? The first thing I'd like to say is that um, we had that extraordinary video clip from the Ban, Ban Ki-moon, and I'm not sure how many of you appreciate the significance of it. He doesn't do video messages to corporate commercial conferences. And the reason why he's done this one is because he is so concerned about the issue of climate change. And He's on the front line of the intel coming from everywhere in the world. And he understands, as do the others involved, that we're talking about peaking carbon emissions in 2020. That's less than five years' time. That's what we need to do if we're going to keep global average temperatures below two degrees, which is 
life or death, as you know, for, for Pacific Islanders and many other low-lying low, low coastal areas. So we need to hold what he said. He said that we have a blueprint for sustainable development, and he said the future's in your hands. How is it in your hands? Well, in Paris, every country put forward its climate commitments. And these were, if you go and look at them, a lot of them are in climate gobbledygook speak, but they are essentially the formation of climate investment plans, the, be the beginning, the starting point of every country creating its climate investment plan. There is a lot of commonality of activity that's listed in those plans. So, to Mark's point, sustainable transport, clean energy are writ large in what countries want to do across the world. And these are the new investment themes, Mark's right, just because you get into sustainable transport doesn't mean to say that you're going to get a winner every time. But it's well worth looking at what companies are in that space and know that there is a, a very fundamental driving force coming behind their future prospects in a positive way. Can we have a slide? I've got one slide I'd like to share with you. In the last three years, the amount of money that has moved out of fossil fuels at some level from total exclusion in the portfolio, just talking to Mark Mobius, he says he has clients already requiring that, um, through to um, those institutions that are saying we're going to start taking our exposure down, we'll start off by not investing in coal. The figure has gone from zero to 3.4 trillion US. That's the amount of money that is looking for a new home. At the moment, as we were talking about earlier, quite a lot of them have been really smart and just got out of energy, okay? <laughs> which has been, as we all know, quite a turbulent sector to invest in. But the, the thing that I find very interesting, having tracked this area for many years, is that the kind of rather naff response in previous cycles, because this isn't the first time the three of us have been speaking to investor conferences. I think we're on about the third cycle of um, uh, the investment community paying attention to this area, the first being in the late 90s. But if you look to see what those institutions, those investment funds and investment institutions have done to finesse their thinking, it's really exciting, guys. There are ways of getting out, of, re of transitioning, of recalibrating your portfolio that doesn't expose you just to the risks of the clean energy emergent industries. As Mark says, there's a whole energy efficiency theme which correlates much better, much more closely with uh, retail energy prices, certainly in more developed countries like the UK. And so for the UK, for example, impacts investors, some of you may have heard of them, they've been at this a long time. They've been looking at how they can take the energy efficiency theme further. They've identified 160 stocks. It's about 1.3 trillion in market capitalization of companies that are in that broadest term, in that sector, which investors could look to to, to recalibrate their portfolios. This kind of thinking is really exciting and it's gonna make your job a lot, lot easier. Um, so I think that, that I just end by saying that, um, which picks up on something that Christine said, that um, uh, the commitments that were made in Paris, these country commitments, um, the work that was done to kind of like, what does this mean? Are we way off track? A lot of people were thinking, oh, the commitments that come through in Paris, they're not even going to get us to a four degree world, let alone, alone below two degrees. Well, the good news is that the mass or menos calculation is that the commitments that were made in Paris get us to a 2.7 degree world, right? So if those commitments are financed and made, we are really getting somewhere. And with the five year ratchet mechanism, we have a chance of pulling down emissions 
by hopefully by 2020 um, and, the, uh, and the ensuing decade, so that by 2030, we're in a net zero carbon world. We are literally pulling more out of the atmosphere than we're putting into it. And all of us uh, either have children, grandchildren, or no uh, nieces and nephews, the least thing we can do is try and make that world for, for next generations. And I really hope if there's one takeout from this conference, it is that you'll pick up the phone to Credit Suisse. They're really well qualified. They know about these issues. They've got amazing people like Sandra who are working on these issues um, to really make much more happen in these next five years. Thanks, Tessa. Christine. China, coal? When's China finished with coal-fired generation? Is that... Let's get right into it. Yeah. The, um, well, let me just make one point from what Tessa has said. Um, if a particular government is serious about climate change, what we have to do is go and knock on the doors of the emitters and the businesses within our jurisdiction and basically say to them, I'm going to keep coming come and knock, knock on your door, because every five years I need to produce something that is in addition to what we said we're going to do. Now, the thing about coal is, and, and please, I'm not speaking for or against coal, mm. but I'm just looking at China, and this is my personal view, because the government in Hong Kong doesn't have a particular view about coal in China. The world, I think China feels, China and probably the world is not yet ready to not use coal. It has come up with a major plan to reduce coal by ramping up other sources. Um, it is also today a leader in the technology of ultra supercritical super critical coal technology. China has invested a lot in this technology because China believes it needs to continue to use coal, and that there are other countries around the world that will have to continue to use coal for a period of time. So you may say they look at ultra supercritical coal as a transition technology. So the thing about tr stranded assets in the future, I'll leave Mark to talk about, but at the policy making level today in China, this is a life wire debate. So even though ultra supercritical coal is more efficient, more efficient and therefore it will emit less carbon, um, should China seriously ramp it down? When should that start? Or should it continue to uh, uh, invest in this technology uh, and go further, as well as invest in carbon capture and sequestration? So I think at this moment in time, it is going to continue to invest. It's going to look at carbon capture. In terms of what the policy should be in the coming years, this is still being debated at the highest level. Mark. Yeah, so um, I must say my current obsession is with ultra super critical to coal in Asia and the whole coal, coal issue in Asia. Um, so essentially, that's right. So one of the reasons why emissions are decoupling is the Chinese are replacing old coal with, old, with supercritical. That's about a 25% saving in carbon, roughly. Now, cat gas might give you 50%, but it's also true. If you take frack gas out of Australia uh, and you turn that into LNG and ship it, its carbon footprint isn't quite half. Um, but anyway, just for a moment, let's assume that gas has got a better story than supercritical coal. So the problem with all this is, is these are 40-year asset lives. Actually, they're 80 years. You run these things forever. Um, and so it does go down to the stranded asset political issue um, in the long run. So that's why I said 20 years from now, there'll be a lot of stranded assets out there, because Asia's running an all-of-the-above energy policy. You know, let's build it all. We might need it. We don't know. And it's military security. It's all sorts of things that are driving those policies, understandably, in a sense. But that means that at the moment, I think actually there's an excellent piece of research done by Greenpeace, which shows us a trillion dollars of capex on the table for coal plants around the world. That's not a bad number. So 
Is that going to be stranded assets 20 years out because they need ramping down? Now, one thing that's interesting about ultra supercritical is that normally coal plants have to run near capacity. You just turn them on and off. Supercritical will actually fluctuate. You can actually change the capacity ratio. It's a bit more like gas. So the argument is that China will ramp down its capacity ratios in coal in order to ramp up everything else when they even out the carbon targets. You live in hope. But all you do know is that that'll be a big political battle. You know, the coal industry is powerful, the renewable industry, the gas industry, all of the above will be battling it out over the next 20 years. Hence my view. This is going to be a very interesting and tricky uh, sort of set of equations. Ultimately, I believe, and I did have a second chart I forgot to show on the Chinese five-year plan. I don't know if they can put it up, but China's pretty serious. If you look at this five-year plan, the, both the efficiency and carbon reductions are very, very large. And it looks to us, as we plug in their forecasts into a, what we call the Kaya equation for emissions, that China will have a very small increase in emissions between now and 2020. It's very close to peaking. But as they build these very long-term you know, coal stations, the question is, how will they work out in the long run? And then I'll finish by saying, you know, we've always taken, haven't we always taken the view if anyone can handle stranded assets and zombies, the Chinese can, because somehow they'll ride them off and it'll all be good on the day. Um, but it seems in this conference, I'm hearing they're thinking about that. There's rather a lot to write off uh, and a lot of problems in that. So, again, I just wonder whether, the, whether I understand why there is uncertainty. Uh, but I would hope that very quickly uh, for Southeast Asia, the view that coal is not going to work and that the cost of solar will so dramatically drop in the next 10 years, which I believe, with with storage with it, the economics will force the retirement of those coal plants anyway. And so why build some zombies? Mark, you mentioned um, one of the game changers for investors to look at is, is batteries and when the price of batteries uh, and the scale of them crashes. Asking the panel, are there any other signposts that investors should be looking for that are game changers in terms of this whole global warming? Christine? Oh, absolutely. Um, just now, we're, we talked about transportation. We talked about new energy. There is waste. And waste basically is going to be all waste to energy. It's going to be recovery of uh, resources, of the materials used. Um, for example, at lunch we talked about the car industry and if the presentation in your event yesterday about driverless cars and how we're going to use, uh, well, we don't need so many cars, this is fundamentally going to have to change how we design cities and also what do you do with the car fleet? What, what do you and I do with the cars that we may no longer be running but it's very expensive to keep it in the garage? because they want to use the garage for much, much higher usage. Will car companies take back the cars? Uh, will they go into a service rental model rather than making cars? And in making cars, can they disassemble the car but use many parts of it for new vehicles or for some kind of uh, alternative resource usages? So I do also see that in the next 10, 20 years, this would be a, a very major trend. Mark, any other game changers you see? Um, well, I think the ratchets are important. I, I mean, as mm. I do think policy will continue to ratchet. So watch I mean, the five year. Game. Yeah, and also, you know, often we say, oh, well, you know, uh, the oil price has got lower, and therefore, does that mean, you know, it's more competitive? But at the end of the day, you know, these emission standards in the transport industry are not going to go away, and they're pretty powerful. And I think that, you know, there are some key sort of specific policies. Don't get caught up in carbon pricing. <laughs> Just very key specific set of policies, which I think will continue to send send those signals um, that I think, you know, so. And just the costs. Again, I'm going to say, I mentioned it. So it's not just batteries. I think the potential drop in centralized solar costs in the big CSPs and so on, which will sit closer to the deserts, 
um, these are going to prove to be 24, they're going to prove to be close to base load um, gigawatt facilities and they are going to be awesomely competitive in the next 10 years in my view. And Tessa, what game changes and signposts would you ask investors well, to look for? A, a few. I mean, I, I spend quite a lot of time in London, as you can probably tell from my accent. And the, the uh, kind of a data point that's just recently come out is that there are almost as many people cycling to work every day as there are going to work in a car. And London's reconfiguring, if any of you know it. You know, there's this amazing superhighway for cyclists all the way to Westminster, and it's now going up the Farringdon Road. And it's like, I love cycling, and it's the best thing. It's such fun, and it's, the temperature's perfect. So here in Hong Kong, what's, what's, what's the kind of signal? It's, it's people getting electric vehicles, electric bikes. They're a dream. They're hilarious to drive, ride, because you don't have to make much effort. Um, and anyone who hasn't got an electric vehicle, I strongly recommend you get one, because as soon as you've got one, you get it, right? They are amazing. We've just been talking about that. So the, what's happening in the transport industry is definitely a game changer. Uh, I think that the other area which, you know, I, I absolutely go along with the energy stuff and, you know, what, what's happening there. But the, for this part of the world and, um, and globally, What's happening in agriculture and forestry is also very important because um, government signals, again, um, influence um, what happens on the ground. And certainly it, it's very um, country and regional specific, but um, I can speak as a farmer in Scotland and say that the subsidy regime, which is driven by EU, and I guarantee that this will carry on in Scotland, even if we pull out of, um, of England, chooses to come out of, of the EU, um, uh, the subsidy regime is sending a very strong signal to farmers to farm in a climate smart way. And you're going to see that happening more and more and more. And there are really interesting things going on in the US and other places which are defining how uh, forestry and, and agriculture is happening. Um, and, you know, investors may think, how do we access this asset class? But you are already, there's a big land investment piece of every portfolio, and that's going to impact returns in terms of what the underlying assets are doing. I think there's another uh, issue that Mark mm. mentioned that we should pick up, because you talked about energy efficiency. And really, you know, any of you who are not doing it, who's not paying attention to companies, uh, who, who's not paying attention to companies who should be doing it, I really think you should. Because also governments, including mine, we are going to look at how to tighten energy codes and so on. And the property sector, you linked it to the property sector. And in Hong Kong, those are our major listed companies. That's where we spend all our time. This is a service economy. And you know, if you look at cities, you can identify many that are not too dissimilar. And you are going to see governments all around the world tightening the uh, uh, standards for buildings, greener buildings, healthier buildings, much more water and energy efficient buildings. Um, there's going to be innovations coming in this area. We need the management to take them all together and produce the kind of living and working environment that you and I all want to be in. And it's all possible today. We need to have a chat with the leaders of that industry. You know, we want to kickstart those earlier. Okay, what is it that we should be doing? I mean, this is the kind of new conversation. If we want it to happen faster, the five-year ratchet mechanism, it reminds us policymakers to have to keep doing it. So we're going to keep knocking on the doors of the industry in property, in transport, in waste, to really say to them, what can we offer in the next round? So property development in Hong Kong, very major target. Mm -hmm. I might open the floor now to questions. Uh, the microphones. Do we have any questions? Yes. Thank you for a great um, presentation so far to begin with. Um, just one question. What if these assumptions about global warming are wrong? Not that it's happening. I'm fully in agreement and there's a lot of evidence on that. What I'm saying is we've seen that high carbon emissions have been linked to higher rates of plant growth. 
There's been some evidence coming out that Russia and Canada might see a massive agricultural boom if um, glo global temperatures continue to rise quite significantly. If that is the case, and that actually there are some significant benefits to global warming, not just costs, could it be, with technological improvements in the extraction of coal and other fossil fuels, that actually this repricing might go in the opposite direction if many people in this room are all within the agreement that global warming is happening at the moment and a lot of these investors have therefore priced in the, some of the assumptions you've brought, not assumptions, but the estimates which you've portrayed. Thank you. Uh, Mark? I, I, I've not heard that one put often, but I would mention that uh, yesterday uh, Stern and Dietz um, at Grantham at um, in London put out a paper saying the cost of global warming was $24 trillion on their estimates. So it's hard to see, while there are always winners and losers, the losers are really big in this game. So the fact that, I mean, if you really get into it, I'm not a climate scientist, but back at Deutsche, we, you know, we paid a lot of them to tell us stuff. And essentially, you know, you would have, I mean, the, the you know, the Mediterranean becomes virtually a desert. It just goes on and on. So if you believe the science, if you believe what they're telling us, and you have to believe it, if you believe there's warming, then if you then take what the scientists are then modeling, it's a pretty dramatically negative outlook at a global level. Now, the fact that, you know, the North Sea apparently becomes like the Mediterranean, maybe the Brits are big winners, you know. <laughs> But unfortunately, it ain't so good if you live in Nice. So, you know what I mean? So, I would say to you that the moment all the economics, all the modelling, all the universities, all the governments say that the net effect is pretty deteriorous. I would just say that the, um, the cartoon I put up, to my mind, says it all. Because why wouldn't you want the kind of economy that the Green Solutions is driving us towards? It's, it's better for our health, it's better for everything. Can I ask, a uh, moderator's privilege, can I ask a question? Christine, do we underestimate the politics of the changes that need to come with global warming? Oh, actually, we must never underestimate the politics in any subject. Um, you know, it is how it is. Now, in terms of, uh, maybe I can just stick to, to China. Yeah. Um, the, I, I know at invest, in, investment conference right now, we're talking about zombie companies and you know, what Chinese companies have to do. And it seems like the, the, the next immediate period is very, very tough. Now, if I look at the policy space, I, I think these are the questions I would ask in terms of different countries. Within government structures or within you know, the policy, the, po the, the policy community, are there, are, 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 there cons are there strong investments in just understanding what climate change means, new technology, you know, what is it that, that should chart a country's future? If, there, if your conclusion is a certain country has all of those things in, in, in place, then the trajectory of policy, despite the, the, the political cycles, at least you know there is a foundation of that knowledge going forward. You could have a government, like in Australia, that says forget the carbon tax, right? We'll revert policies. Um, however, but if you have at least the thinking consistency, that means that it will influence whoever comes into power in terms of at least what's the foundation of that knowledge. And then, of course, there's the international stage from where we're sitting today with COP21, with the wretched mechanism, with the commitment to continue to upgrade on the science. I see that this is going to continue to drive global discussion. So, you know, any particular country can't just climb back into a shell. What is the risk for countries that decide to go light on policy? Um, what's the risk for those countries, but also for the companies working in those countries? And, you know, you've referred to Australia. We're in a transition or flux in, in policy. 
Well, what we've seen around the world is where there has been strong regulation on tightening standards and pushing the technology, you see that companies in that jurisdiction have generally benefited. I mean, I accept what Mark says, which is not all of them will benefit because some of them may not just know how to manage their companies properly, but the technology itself will, will force the space and it makes that economy more competitive. So if you're in a, in a space where your government, you know, you don't get that added push, you're not able to use your economy to test things, maybe as a company you're worse off. And we've seen several companies or many companies now start doing the scenarios of a two degree world and what it means for their business. Um, Mark, what would you be asking those companies um, in looking at as an investor when you're looking at the scenarios they've put forward? Well, a uh, carbon tracker, of course, we focused on the fossil fuel industries for that. And um, the two degree stress test, I mean, as Exxon said, a two degree stress test is quite complex. What are your assumptions? Um, you know, if you're going to decide there's going to be a lot of carbon capture and storage, well, you're going to get a very different result. I think BHP's two degree stress test was rather hopeful about CCS, so well, they're not too disrupted. If you don't think there's going to be CCS, you're going to be much more disrupted if you're a, if you're a heavy emitter. So to some extent, I think that our view is that we should ask people to test the IEA um, NP, uh, new policy scenario. That's not, by the way, their central or forecast. It's a scenario, but it's the middle of the road one that people seem to feel, and it's INDC driven. Um, and within their assumptions, how does that affect your business model? Um, and we've got, I think we've got some interesting work uh, that will come out shortly that shows Actually, you know, it can be a much more lower risk world for the energy markets to be cautious on demand, cautious on supply, try and keep their margins up. I don't think the word margin and commodity companies go together. I don't think they need to read the word margin at times. So, you know, instead of having massively oversupplied markets into uncertain demand and crashes in prices and you know, these vast cycles. Maybe, maybe people could take a little bit more of a cautious view. By the way, this is just a, a wish. <laughs> and take a little bit more of a cautious view. Expect demand to be a little less dramatic than they might on BAU. Be cautious on their high cost projects, which I think they can be. And then maybe support their markets in a more reasonable way in what would then be a transition. There's no reason now why the transition itself can't still work without being massively disruptive. But we're close to when it becomes just too far. People have done too many investment decisions in the wrong direction, and the disruption again will just get bigger and bigger. We have a question up there. I'd like to take it back to the kind of like individual investor level. Um, what is the, um, do, does the panel have like a very simple three step, this is what every investor should do, whether or not you're a pension investor or an asset manager to make yourself less carbon dependent or, or however you want to phrase the terminology. But like a simple three step, this is what you should be doing. Tessa? I, I think that answer is different depending on whether you're an institution or an individual. Um, if I was an individual, I think I'd join something like Share Action, which is just the most extraordinary, <laughs> um, very youth-driven, kind of quite cross-youth-driven, like our investors are not doing their job for us, we're going to take life into our own hands. And there's just a very colourful conversation there, which is highly informative for how you think about investment. For institutions, I do think it's about going back to the consultants, the Mercers and the Watson Wyatts and so on, and asking them what they think um, the, the right answers are, because... Cambridge Associates and Mercers, I know, have got some really interesting thinking on how to start the transition process um, whilst managing risk and protecting returns. Mark, we've, we've talked about the yeah. need to ask companies their scenarios. Are there other... Well, the, basically, the push at the moment is to indeed do the stress test on your own portfolios in the asset management community. So that version is... What are your exposures to carbon and technologies? I quite like the idea that um, 
that uh, two-degree investing in Paris is pushing, which is a, a technology exposure analysis of portfolios. And in other words, where are you exposed to which technologies which are carbon intensive and not carbon intensive? And you know, how do you feel about that? So I think the first thing to do is just recognize what your exposure is. And I think after that, um, you know, the rule of thumb is uh, to decide, I'm afraid it's just back to economics again, it's just back to what you do every day, you know, what are the return profiles looking like in those different technologies and how much risk do you want to take in them. It's just risk analysis in my view. So I actually think it's find out what you're exposed to, really find out what you're exposed to, and then ask yourself, am I happy with that as an investor? Forget ESG and sustainability. I mean, what do the returns look like? Yeah. You know, I don't think they look so good on one side of the ledger. So, Christine? Well, I mean, maybe as a government official, I'll say something uh, from a government's point of view, but not, I think not too dissimilar to the outcomes of what you're suggesting. You asked for a, a kind of three-point mm. checklist, right? I think number one is check what the government policies are. And as investors representing you know, large companies, I think it's possible for you to knock on the doors of government and say, look, I want to have a deeper understanding of what your policies are. What, what, are, what are your immediate policies today? How, how do you think it's driving change? And what are you planning to do next? Very few people come and actually talk to us, but I am getting more uh, people from your sector coming to ask us uh, these questions. The second thing is, look at our policies and what is it really targeting? Who's, what is it, who is it really going to affect? And then thirdly, go and ask those companies, how are you dealing, how are you dealing with this? And I think with, with that focus coming from the public policy side, you know, then, then looking at the questions that Tessa and Mark are, are asking you to do, I think you get a fuller picture. And I have to say, of course, we do advocate engagement because if you're passive, I and mean, what can you do anyway? You can't divest, I mean, we understand that, and you can't really tilt your portfolio much. And if 80% of the world's funds under management are really passive, which they probably are, mm -hmm. what is the solution then? Well, the answer is engagement, mm -hmm. in theory. So you have to take your engagement power and say, I don't want you to blow my capital. That's our whole thesis. You know, don't go and blow the trillion dollars on oil and gas we don't need. Don't go and blow the trillion dollars on uh, power plants we don't need. Now we see that. There are probably some people here that are doing this. Um, and certainly we talk to a lot of investors who are pretty serious about that level of engagement with companies to work as in partnership with them as active shareholders. And that's very important. We're out of time. Can I thank the panel, Christine Lowe, Mark Fulton and Tessa Tannen, and a special thank you to Mr Banky Moon. Thank you. Yeah.